Remember that browser cookies are just files on the hard drive of the client. So if the session itself, the session information around authentication, authorization, any kind of traceable information that you can use for later reestablishment, if that's kept in a cookie, well, it's kept on the hard drive and that's just yet another file that you compromise when you compromise a system. You steal those out and then you examine them. There are a number of tools out there, not just to examine cookies, although Notepad is a fine example of a, of a tool that can examine cookies, but in a lot of cases, cookies can be compromised. They can be changed. Cookies oftentimes are not authenticated. They're not signed. They're not validated. So there may be an expiration date in a cookie that you just hack with Notepad or you use a tool to change it and change the checksum for it. And then you've got a cookie that lasts a lot longer than the intention was. Because they're just files, again, it's just a matter of footprinting to identify which clients are using the credentials you want, as you learned in an earlier video. And then once you've compromised that client system, stealing the cookies and then analyzing them offline. Some of them may not be usable. Some of them may be usable, but it's certainly worth a try. This almost never sets off alarms on the client, just looking at the cookies, just stealing the cookies and, and finding out what's in there because you're not really affecting the client. It's more of a read-only attack. So it's pretty elegant and it's extremely low noise, very low likelihood once the compromise has been made of actually setting off any alarm bells. Calculating session ID numbers and parameters, occasionally this is possible. It's actually really, really hard to do because it does require some type of non-random sequence number, which is one of those vulnerabilities in operating systems or, or services that's immediately patched, or some type of other predictable data. This, this idea of session calculation, it is feasible, it's just not very practical. It's not one of the first attacks I would mount against a client, it's actually not one of the ones I would do almost ever. Just because unless there's a major vulnerability, it's not going to be likely to succeed. And you will occasionally see a, a service bulletin or, or an update, like for a Windows update, for example, that says, oh, in some cases, the TCP sequence number could actually be predicted, so we've made a change in the code. That's what this the patch is preventing, is this type of vulnerability. And again, those are extremely high priority, extremely straightforward fixes. So these vulnerabilities, when they're there, don't last very long and are almost always fixed. I do not recommend this, but it may be on uh, exams or you may read about it. So this is something just to be aware of that it exists. And that's what it's all about is calculating the session ID and then using that calculation to predict the next sequence number or some next uh, data that you can actually use to get in the middle. Similar type of attack, but one that requires a bit more pre-work to compromise is hijacking based on sequence and act numbers, uh, actually being able to predict those, being able to calculate those. And they almost always require you to do some type of network sniffing on the session at the client end to figure out what the seek and act numbers are, where they're going, how far they're incrementing and so forth, and then jump into the middle by crafting some special IP packets that actually use the correct seek and act numbers to convince the server that you are the client. It also requires at the same time you to potentially block incoming traffic from the server to the client and become the client. So you need to at the same time uh, interrupt the connection and intercept the traffic. It's relatively hard to engineer, but it's an interesting type of attack in theory. Another type of, of session hijacking attack is an interesting one. A brute force hijacking attempt is actually either really, really easy or really, really hard, depending on the pre-knowledge and the footprinting work that you've done. Essentially, a brute force attack against session hijacking goes like this. You use some type of knowledge that you've gathered around URL parameters, whether from sniffing the connections, uh, connecting to the server on your own, doing some kind of HTTP header captures, or even doing things that are a little bit different, like screen monitoring, grabbing screen captures from the client, uh, 
looking over the client's shoulder, which you learn about in the video on social engineering, and taking a look at some of the URLs that are going on there, or even when someone uh, email sends an email with a URL that has in it uh, part of a, a session ID. Using that information from email, from shoulder surfing, from screen scraping, from footprinting, from sniffing, something like that, actually taking a look at the URL and determining are there any hints about the session ID, what types of session IDs the system uses, the server uses, whether they're predictable, sequential, anything like that, and then just brute force trying different session IDs in the URL until it works. It, again, is either super, super easy or super, super hard, depending on how much knowledge you have of what's going on on the server and also how resistant the server is, how resistant by design it is. A good example of brute force session hijacking really is at the very top here, an example of this URL that has a, a session ID, AFAD0110. If you're sniffing or shoulder surfing and you see that session ID equals, and that's actually how the session is held open, uh, this session ID in the browser is appended to all transactions within the session, you may actually be able to get back to your desk or go somewhere else, you know, Starbucks, wherever you're going to go, and try different session IDs that are similar to this existing session, or even try the same session ID to see if that'll work. It's it's actually more of a trial and error thing, but it's somewhat predictable. I've worked with some clients that use session IDs uh, on, an, on a session by session basis. I've seen some where they stick the account ID or some type of, of statement ID at the actual end of the URL. So just sequencing this one up, one down, using the same one later, sometimes yields positive results. It sometimes actually allows a hack to occur. And that's kind of great. It's not terribly different than URL manipulation with a SQL injection attack. But instead of trying to pass database commands, you're trying to use a session or get access to something that you shouldn't have access to. Occasionally, you'll also see this in the form of a parameter on the end of a session, on, on the end of a URL that establishes the session by explicit path. It might actually be a path into a file or a DLL or something like that on the server. Again, that's another opportunity for you to examine the URLs, modify them, or even copy them and use those as part of an attack.